We continue now with the life and revelations of St. Gertrude. Whence it is that we sometimes feel less fervor at the moment of communion than at any other time. As Gertrude prayed for a person who complained of having less devotion on the days on which she communicated than on others, our Lord said to her, This has not happened by chance, but by a particular providence, which inspires feelings of devotion at unexpected times, to elevate the heart of man which is so enslaved by the body. But on festivals and at the time of communion, I withdraw this grace, preferring to occupy the hearts of my elect with good desires or humility, and this may be more advantageous to their welfare than the grace of devotion. God permits the just to fall for their humiliation. As the saint prayed for a person who had abstained from receiving the body of the Lord, fearing to be an occasion of scandal, our Lord made known his will by this comparison. As a man who washes his hands to remove a stain, removes at the same time not only what he has seen, but also cleanses his hands perfectly, so the just are allowed to fall into some trifling faults, that they may become more agreeable to me by their repentance and humility. But there are some who contradict my designs in this by neglecting the interior beauty which I desire to see after their penance, thinking of the exterior and of the judgment of men. And this they do when they deprive themselves of the grace which they might receive in the sacrament from the fear of scandalizing those who do not think them sufficiently prepared. Jesus Christ himself prepares the saint for communion. As the saint was about to receive Holy Communion, she felt herself invited by Jesus Christ himself. It appeared to her that she was in the celestial kingdom, and that she was seated in glory near the Eternal Father to eat with him at his table. But as she considered that she was neither properly attired nor sufficiently prepared, she endeavored to withdraw. Then the Son of God came to her and led her to a retired place to prepare her for this banquet. At first he remitted her sins by washing her hands, offering his passion for her amendment. Then he gave her a necklace, bracelets, and rings, and having thus adorned her, he desired her to walk discreetly, as one so adorned should do, and not like a foolish person, who even when thus attired would be despised rather than honored. She understood by these words that they walk like fools, who after they've been cured of their defects are as pusillanimous as ever, because they have not an entire confidence that Jesus Christ will supply for their defects. Of the Value of Communicating for the Souls in Purgatory One day, after communion, the saint offered the host which she had just received for the souls in purgatory, and perceiving the great benefit they obtained thereby, she was amazed and said to her spouse, My God, since I am obliged to declare for thy glory that thou dost honor me continually with thy presence, or rather, that thou abidest in my soul, unworthy as I am, how is it? that thou dost not work through me as though thou hast done to-day after I have received thy adorable body. He replied, It is not easy for every one to approach a king who remains always in his palace. But when his love for his queen induces him to go forth, then all may behold, through her kindness, his pomp and magnificence. Thus, when moved by my love, I visit one of the faithful, who is free from mortal sin, in the sacrament of the altar, all who are in heaven, on earth, or in purgatory, receive immense benefits thereby. On another occasion, the saint humbled herself deeply before approaching the Holy Communion, in honor and in imitation of the humility of the Son of God in descending into limbo, then uniting herself with his descent she found herself descending to the very depths of purgatory. 
and humbling herself still lower, she heard our Lord say to her, I will draw you to me in the sacrament of the altar, in such a manner that you will draw after you all those who shall perceive the odor of your desire. Having received this promise from our Lord, she desired after communion that he would release as many souls as she could divide the host into particles in her mouth. But as she tried to effect this, he said to her, In order that you may know that my mercy is above all my works, and that the abyss of my mercy cannot be exhausted, I am ready to grant you, through the merit of this life-giving sacrament, more than you dare to ask me. Chapter 18 The Devotion of St. Gertrude to the Mother of God She is taught to invoke her as the white lily of the adorable Trinity and the vermilion rose of heaven. As Gertrude offered herself to God during her prayer, and inquired how he desired her to occupy herself at this time. He replied, Honor my mother, who is seated at my side, and employ yourself in praising her. Then the saint began to salute the Queen of Heaven, reciting the verse, Paradisus Voluptus, Paradise of Delights, and extolling her because she was the abode full of delights which the impenetrable wisdom of God who knows all creatures perfectly, had chosen for his dwelling. And she besought her to obtain for her a heart adorned with so many virtues that God might take pleasure in dwelling therein. Then the Blessed Virgin inclined towards her and planted in her heart the different flowers of virtue, the rose of charity, the lily of chastity, the violet of humility, the flexibility of obedience, and many other gifts, thus showing how promptly she assists those who invoke her assistance. Then the saint addressed her thus, Gaude morum disciplina, rejoice model of discipline, praising her for having ordered her desires, judgment, and affection with more care and circumspection than the rest of mankind, and for having served the Lord who dwelt in her with such respect and reverence that she had never given him the least occasion of pain in her thoughts, words, or actions. Having besought her to obtain for her also the same grace, it appeared to her that the Mother of God sent her all her affections under the form of young virgins, recommending each in particular to unite her dispositions to those of her client, and to supply for any defects into which she might fall. By this also she understood with what promptitude the Blessed Virgin assists those who invoke her. Then the saint besought our Lord to supply for her omissions and devotion to his Blessed Mother, which he was pleased to do. The following day, as Gertrude prayed, the Mother of God appeared to her in the presence of the ever-adorable Trinity under the form of a white lily with three leaves, one standing erect, and the other two bent down. By this she understood that it was not without reason that the Blessed Mother of God was called the White Lily of the Trinity, since she contained in herself, with more plenitude and perfection than any other creature, the virtues of the Most Holy Trinity, which she had never sullied by the slightest stain of sin. The upright leaf of the lily represented the omnipotence of God the Father, and the two leaves which bent down the wisdom and love of the Son and the Holy Spirit, to which the Holy Virgin approaches so nearly. Then the Blessed Virgin made known to her that if any one salutes her devoutedly as the white lily of the Trinity and the vermilion rose of heaven, she will show her how she prevails by the omnipotence of the Father, how skillful she is in procuring the salvation of men by the wisdom of the Son, and with what an exceeding love her heart is filled by the charity of the Holy Ghost. The Blessed Virgin added these words, I will appear at the hour of death to those who salute me thus in such glory that they will anticipate the very joys of heaven. From this time the saint frequently saluted the Holy Virgin or her images with these words, 
Hail, white lily of the ever-peaceful and glorious Trinity! Hail, effulgent rose, the delight of heaven, of whom the King of heaven was born, and by whose milk he was nourished. Do thou feed our souls by the effusions of thy divine influences. Chapter 19 How the Praises Offered to the Saints May Be Referred to God as St. Gertrude was accustomed to refer all that was sweet and agreeable to her beloved, when she heard or read the praise of the Blessed Virgin or of the saints, and was more than usually moved thereby, she raised her heart to God, so that she thought more of him than of the saint whose memory was honored. And as she heard a sermon on the Feast of the Annunciation, in which the Blessed Virgin was spoken of exclusively, and no mention was made of the incarnation of the Son of God, she was so grieved that as she passed the altar of the Blessed Virgin, returning from the sermon, she did not salute her with her usual devotion, but rather offered her salutation to Jesus, the blessed fruit of her womb. But afterwards she feared she had displeased this august queen, until our Lord consoled her by these loving words, Fear not, Gertrude, my beloved. For although you have referred the honor and praise which you usually render to my dear mother exclusively to me, it will not be the less agreeable to her. Chapter 20 How God desires to be sought for by the soul that loves him, and how he loves us when we suffer. On one occasion, when the saint was prevented from assisting at Vespers by some infirmity, she exclaimed, Lord, wouldst thou not be more honored if I were in choir with the community, engaged in prayer, and fulfilling the duties of my rule, than by my being here, passing my time uselessly, in consequence of this illness? Our Lord replied, Be assured that the bridegroom takes more pleasure in conversing with his bride familiarly in his house than when he displays her before the world adorned with her richest ornaments. But these words she understood, that the soul appears in public and clothed with all her state, when she occupies herself in good works for the glory of God, but that she reposes in secret with her spouse, when she's hindered by any infirmity from attending to those exercises. For in this state she is deprived of the satisfaction of acting according to her own inclination, and she remains abandoned entirely to the will of God, and therefore it is that God takes most pleasure in us when we find least occasion of pleasing and glorifying ourselves. Chapter 21 The saint receives a triple absolution and benediction from the Blessed Trinity through the merits of Jesus Christ. As the saint heard Mass one day with the greatest fervor, it appeared to her that her guardian angel took her in his arms as if she were a little child at the Kyrie Eleison and presented her to God the Father to receive his benediction, saying, Eternal Father, bless thy little child. And because for a time he replied not, as if he would testify by his silence that so miserable a creature was unworthy of this favor, she began to enter into herself, and to consider her unworthiness and nothingness with extreme confusion. Then the Son of God arose, and gave her the merits of his most holy life to supply her defects, so that she appeared as if clothed with a rich and shining robe, and as if she had attained to the full age and strength of Jesus Christ. Then the Eternal Father inclined lovingly towards her, and gave her his absolution thrice, as a sign of the triple remission of all the sins which she had committed against his omnipotence in thought, word, and deed. The saint offered in thanksgiving the adorable life of his only son, and at the same time the precious stones with which her garments were adorned emitted a harmonious concert to the eternal glory of God, which testified how agreeable it is to him to offer him the all-perfect and holy life of his Son. The same angel then presented her to God the Son, saying, Bless thy sister, O King of heaven, 
and having received from him a triple benediction to efface all the sins she had committed against the divine wisdom, he then presented her to the Holy Spirit with these words, O lover of men, bless thy spouse. And she received from him also a triple benediction in remission of all the sins which she had committed against the divine goodness. Let those who read this reflect on these three benedictions at the Kyrie eleison. Chapter 22 Favors Granted to the Saint During the Recital of the Divine Office Once as the saint was reciting the divine office with extraordinary fervor on the feast of a saint, each word which she uttered appeared to dart like an arrow from her heart into the heart of Jesus, penetrating it deeply and filling it with an ineffable satisfaction. From one end of these arrows rays of light shot forth like stars, which seemed to fall on all the saints, but especially on the one whose festival was celebrated. From the lower end of the arrows drops of dew flowed forth, which fertilized the souls of the living and refreshed the souls in purgatory. As the saint endeavored on another occasion to attach some particular intention to each note and each word of her chant, she was often hindered by the weakness of nature, and at last exclaimed with much sadness, Alas, what fruit can I obtain from this exercise when I am so unstable? But our Lord, who could not endure to behold the affliction of his servant, with his own hands presented her with his divine heart under the figure of a burning lamp, saying to her, Behold, I present to the eyes of your soul my loving heart, which is the organ of the Most Holy Trinity, that it may accomplish all that you cannot accomplish yourself. And thus all will seem perfect to you in my eyes. For even as a faithful servant is always ready to execute the commands of his master, so from henceforth my heart will be always ready at any moment to repair your defects and negligences. Gertrude wondered and feared because of this amazing goodness of her Lord, thinking that it was not becoming for the adorable heart, which is the treasure house of the divinity and the fruitful source of every good, to remain continually near so miserable a creature, to supply for her defects even as a servant attends to his master. But the Lord consoled and encouraged her by this comparison. If you have a beautiful and melodious voice, and take much pleasure in chanting, will you not feel displeased if another person, whose voice is harsh and unpleasant, and who can scarcely utter a correct sound, wishes to sing instead of you, and insists on doing so? Thus my divine heart, understanding human inconstancy and frailty, desires with incredible ardor continually to be invited, either by your words, or at least by some other sign, to operate and accomplish in you what you are not able to accomplish yourself. And as its omnipotence enables it to act without trouble, and its impenetrable wisdom enables it to act in the most perfect manner, so also its joyous and loving charity makes it ardently desire to accomplish this end. Chapter 23 Of the Abundant Virtue Which Flows from the Heart of Jesus Into the Faithful Soul Some days after, as the saint reflected upon the stupendous favor with singular gratitude, she anxiously inquired of the Lord how long it would be continued to her. He replied, As long as you desire to have it, for it would grieve me to deprive you of it. She answered, But is it possible that thy deified heart is suspended like a lamp in the midst of mine, which is, alas, so unworthy of its presence, when at the same time I have the joy of finding in thyself this very same source of all delight? It is even so, replied the Lord, when you wish to take hold of anything, you stretch forth your hand, and then withdraw it again after you have taken it. So also the love which I bear towards you causes me to extend my heart to draw you to me, 
when you are distracting yourself with exterior things. And then, when you have recollected yourself, I withdraw my heart, and you along with it, so that you may enter into me, and thus I make you taste the sweetness of all virtues. Then as she considered on the one hand, with exceeding wonder and gratitude, the greatness of the charity which God had for her, and on the other, her own nothingness, and the great number of her faults, she retired with profound self-contempt into the valley of humility, esteeming herself unworthy of any grace, and having remained therein hidden for some time, he who loves to pour forth his gifts on the humble seemed to make a golden tube come forth from his heart, which descended upon this humble soul in the form of a lamp, making a channel through which he poured forth on her the abundance of all his marvels, so that when she humbled herself at the recollection of her faults, our Lord poured forth on her from his sacred heart all the virtue and beauty of his divine perfection, which concealed her imperfections from the eyes of the divine goodness. And further, if she desired any new ornament, or any of those things which appeared attractive and desirable to the human heart, it was communicated to her with much pleasure and joy by this same mysterious canal. When she had tasted the sweetness of these holy delights for some time, and was adorned with all virtues, not her own, but those given her by God, she heard a most melodious sound, as of a sweet harper harping upon his harp, and these words were sung to her, Come, O mine own, to me, enter, O mine own, into me, abide, O mine own, with me. And the Lord himself explained the meaning of this canticle to her, saying, Come to me, because I love you, and desire that you should be always present before me as my beloved spouse, and therefore I call you. And because my delights are in you, I desire that you should enter into me. Furthermore, because I am the God of love, I desire that you should remain indissolubly united to me, even as the body is united to the spirit, without which it cannot live for a moment. This rapture continued for an hour, and the saint was drawn in a miraculous manner into the heart of Jesus, through this sacred channel of which we've spoken so that she found herself happily reposing in the bosom of her Lord and spouse. What she felt, what she saw, what she heard, what she tasted, what she learned of the words of life, she alone can know. And they who, like her, are worthy to be admitted to this sublime union with their spouse Jesus, their soul's true love, who is God, blessed forever. Amen. Chapter 24 of the sepulchre of Jesus Christ in the faithful soul, and how to make a spiritual cloister in the body and heart of Jesus. On Good Friday, as they made a commemoration of our Lord's burial after the office, Gertrude implored him to bury himself in her soul, and to abide therein forever. Our Lord replied with infinite charity, I will serve as a stone to close the gates of your senses. I will place my affections there as soldiers to guard this stone, to defend your heart against all hurtful affections, and to work in you my divine power for my eternal glory. Then, fearing that she had judged a person harshly for something which she had seen her do, she said to God, Lord, thou hast placed soldiers to guard the entrance of my heart, but alas, I fear they have withdrawn, since I have judged my neighbor so harshly. How can you complain that they have withdrawn, replied our Lord, when at this moment you experience their assistance? For it is a sign that one desires to be united to me when they cannot take pleasure in what displeases me. While they sang the antiphon at Vespers, I saw water springing forth, the Lord said to Gertrude, Behold my heart, let it be your temple. Then go through the other parts of my body and arrange for the other parts of a monastery, wherever it seems best to you. For I desire that my sacred humanity should henceforth be your cloister. 
Lord, replied the saint, I know not how to seek or choose, because I have found such sweetness in thy heart, which thou hast deigned to give me for a temple, that I can find neither repose nor rest out of it. Two things which are absolutely necessary in the cloister. If you desire it, said the Savior, you can still find these two things in my heart. For have you not heard that there are persons who never leave my house even for food or rest, like St. Dominic? Nevertheless, choose in the other parts of my body the places which you have need of for this spiritual monastery. Then Gertrude, obeying the commands of God, chose the feet of her spouse for her lavatory, his hands for her workroom, his mouth for her reception room or chapter room, his eyes for her school, in which she could read, and his ears for her confessional. Then the Lord taught her that whenever she committed any fault, she should ascend to this sacred tribunal by the five degrees of humiliation, which are expressed in those five words, I come to thee, vile, sinful, poor, wicked, and unworthy, O abyss of overflowing goodness, to be cleansed from every stain and purified from all sin. Chapter 25 Of the union of the soul with Jesus Christ, and how she is prepared by the merits of the saints to be an agreeable abode for her God. As Gertrude reflected on different instances of instability, she turned to God and said, It is my only good to be united to thee alone, my beloved, the Lord, inclining towards her and embracing her tenderly, said, And it is always sweet to me to be united to thee, my beloved. As he said these words, all the saints arose and offered their merits before the throne of God for her soul, that it might become more worthy of being his abode. Then she knew how prompt God is in inclining towards the soul that calls upon him, and with what joy all the blessed contribute their merits to supply for our unworthiness. The saint then exclaimed in the fervor of her desires, I salute thee, my most loving Lord, although I am but a vile and abject creature. And she received this reply from the sweetest mercy of God, And I salute you also in return, my beloved spouse. By this she knew that each time a soul says to God, My beloved, my most dear Lord, my sweetest Jesus, or any other words which express her ardent devotion, he often replies to her in a manner which obtains for her a special privilege of grace in heaven, like the special glory which St. John the Evangelist obtained on earth of being called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Chapter 26 Of the Merit of a Good Will and instructions on some words of the divine office. At the Mass, Veni et Ostende, the Lord appeared to St. Gertrude, full of sweetness and grace, breathing forth a holy and vivifying odor, and pouring forth from the august throne of his glory the influences of his love for the sweet feast of his nativity. Then the saint, having prayed him to enrich all who had been recommended to her prayers with special grace, he said to her, I have given to each a tube of pure gold, of which such is the virtue, that by it they may draw forth all they need from my sacred heart. By this mystic tube she understood that good will, by which men may acquire all the spiritual riches which are in heaven and on earth. For example, if any one, burning with the fire of pure and holy desires, endeavors to give God as much thanks and praise and as many testimonies of service and fidelity as certain of his saints have rendered to him, the infinite goodness of God regards this goodwill as if it had really been effected. But this too becomes more brilliant than gold when men thank God for having given them so noble and elevated a will that they might have acquired infinitely greater advantages by it than the whole world could bestow. She knew also that all her sisters who surrounded Jesus Christ received divine grace by similar tubes. Some appeared to receive it directly from the heart of Jesus Christ, others 
from his hands. But the farther from his heart they drew these graces, the more difficulty they had in obtaining them. Whereas those who drew them from his divine heart obtained them more easily, more sweetly, more abundantly. Those who drew directly from his sacred heart represented those persons who conform themselves entirely to the divine will, who desire above all things that this will should be accomplished in them, both in regard to spirituals and temporals. And these persons touch the heart of God so powerfully and render it so favorable to them at the time that God has determined that they receive the torrent of divine sweetness with as much abundance and pleasure as they have abandoned themselves perfectly to his holy will. But those who endeavored to draw their graces from the other members of the body of Jesus Christ represent those persons who endeavored to acquire virtue according to their natural inclinations and the fear and difficulty they experience in proportionate to the extent to which they have relied on their own judgment and have failed to abandon themselves to divine providence. Of the most perfect manner of offering our hearts to God. As Gertrude offered her heart to God in the following manner, Lord, behold my heart, which is detached from all creatures, I offer it to thee freely, beseeching thee to purify it in the sanctifying waters of thy adorable side, and to adorn it with the precious blood of thy sweetest heart and to unite it to thee by the odors of charity, our Lord appeared to her, and offered her heart to his eternal Father, united to his own under the form of a chalice, the two parts of which were joined together by wax. The saint, perceiving this, said with extreme fervor, Grant me the grace, most loving Lord, that my heart may be always before thee like the flasks which princes use, so that thou mayest have it cleansed and filled and emptied according to thy good pleasures, whenever and however thou willest. This request being heard favorably by the Son of God, he said to his Father, Eternal Father, may this soul pour forth for thy infinite glory what mine contains in my humanity. And from that moment, whenever the saint offered her heart to God, saying the words above mentioned, it seemed to her so filled that it poured itself forth in thanksgiving and praises, augmenting the joy of the blessed in heaven and contributing to the adornment of the just on earth, as will be seen hereafter. From this moment the saint knew that God willed her to commit to writing what he had revealed to her that it might be for the benefit of many. Of Confidence in God and of reparation for the contempts offered to him. In Advent, by the response Ecce Venet, she knew that if anyone formed in their heart with a firm purpose, a perfect desire of submitting in all things to the adorable will of God, alike in prosperity as in adversity, they would, by his grace, render the same honor to God by this thought as if they crowned him with a royal diadem. And by these words of the prophet Isaiah, Arise, arise, stand up, O Jerusalem, she understood the advantage which the church militant receives from the devotion of the elect. For when a soul, full of love, turns to God with her whole heart, and with a perfect will of repairing, where possible, all the dishonor done to Jesus Christ, she appeases her anger by her loving charity so that he is willing to pardon the sins of the whole world. By the words, that has drunk the cup of his wrath even to the bottom, may be understood how she has averted the severity of divine justice. But by the following words, that has drunk even to the dregs, she knew that the reprobate have the dregs of this chalice for their portion and can never obtain redemption of refraining from useless words. By these words of Isaiah, thou dost not thy own ways, and thy own will is not found to speak a word. She knew that he who regulates his words and actions thoughtfully, and abstains even from those that are lawful when they are not necessary, will obtain a triple advantage. First, 
he will find a greater pleasure in God according to these words, Thou shalt be delighted in the Lord. Secondly, bad thoughts will have less power over him, for it is said, I will lift thee above the high places of the earth. And thirdly, in eternity the Son of God will communicate the merits of his most holy life more abundantly to him than to others, because by it he has been victorious over every temptation, and gained a glorious victory, as these words express, I will feed thee with the inheritance of Jacob thy father. God made known to her also by these words, Behold, his reward is with him, that our Lord himself, by his love, is the reward of his elect. And he insinuates himself into their souls with such sweetness that they may truly say they are rewarded beyond all their deserts. And his work is before him, that is to say, when we abandon ourselves entirely to divine providence and seek only the accomplishment of the will of God in all things, grace has already rendered us perfect in the sight of God. By these words, Be ye holy, children of Israel, Gertrude learned that those who repent promptly of the sins they have committed and set themselves with a sincere heart to keep the commandments of God are as truly sanctified and as promptly cured as the leper to whom our Lord said, I will be thou made clean. By the word sing ye to the Lord a new canticle, she knew that he sings a new canticle who sings with devotion, because when he has received the grace from God to understand what he sings, his chant becomes agreeable to God. God sends afflictions to cure our souls. By the words the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he hath sent me to heal the contrite of heart, she understood that the Son of God having been sent by his father to heal contrite hearts, was accustomed to send some affliction to his elect, even should it be only exterior, in order to heal them. But when this happens, he does not always deliver them from the affliction which has made them contrite, because it is not hurtful to them, for he prefers to cure that which might cause them eternal death. By the words, In splendoribus sanctorum, in the brightness of the saints, she knew that the light of the divinity is so great and so incomprehensible that even if each saint who has lived or will live from the time of Adam to the end of the world were given a special knowledge of it, as clear, as elevated, and as extended as could be given to any creature, so that none should be able to explain it to the other, nor to share in their knowledge, even should the number of saints be a thousand times greater than it is, the divinity would still remain infinitely beyond their conception. Thus it is not written splendori, but in splendoribus, in the brightness of thy saints, from the womb before the day star I begot thee. how we must carry our cross after Jesus Christ, and how the mercy of God chastises the elect. At the Antiphon, qui volt, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. Gertrude beheld our Lord walking on a road, which seemed pleasant because of the beauty of the verdure and flowers which covered it, but which nevertheless was narrow and rough with thorns. Then she beheld a cross which went before him, and separated the thorns from one another, making the road wider and more easy, while the Saviour turned to those who came after them, and encouraged them, looking at them with a sweet and loving countenance, and saying to them, Let him that will come after me take up his cross, and deny himself, and follow me. By this she knew that our temptations are our crosses. For example, it is a cross to one person to be obliged by obedience to do what he dislikes, to another to be restrained. Now each ought so to carry his cross as to be willing to suffer with a good heart all that crosses him, and yet to neglect nothing which he thinks may be for the glory of God. As they chanted this verse, 
the words of the wicked have prevailed over us, she knew that when any one who has sinned through human frailty is too severely reprehended for it by another, this excessive severity draws down the mercy of God on him and increases his merit. As they sung the Salve Regina at the words, Turn on us those merciful eyes of thine, as the saint desired that our Lord would cure her of a bodily infirmity, he said to her, with a sweet familiarity, Do you not know that I look on you with eyes of mercy whenever you suffer any pain of body or mind? On another occasion, as they sung the words Gloriosum Sanguinum on the feast of some martyrs, she knew that even as blood, which naturally inspires a feeling of horror when considered in itself, is nevertheless praised in Scripture when it is poured forth for Jesus Christ, so omissions of religious duties, from charity or obedience, are so agreeable to God that they may be justly termed glorious. She knew also on another occasion that God, by a secret dispensation of his judgments, sometimes permits sinners to receive a reply which serves only to harden them in their obstinacy. When they seek by artifice to ascertain from the elect what is hidden from them. Even as the prophet Ezekiel writes, He that shall place his uncleanness in his heart, and set up the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and shall come to the prophet, inquiring of me by him, I the Lord will answer him according to the multitude of his uncleanness. That without the consent of the will we do not sin, and how we are obliged to reprove evildoers. As they sung these words in honor of St. John, Horat Verus Ecletali, she understood that as the virtue of faith preserved John from the poison, so the action of the will which resists sin preserves the soul pure, however mortal the venom may be, which glides into the heart against its will. By the versicle Dignare Dominoi, she knew that when man has recourse to God and beseeches him to preserve him from sin, even though he should seem afterwards, by a secret permission of providence, to fall into some considerable fault, his will nevertheless will not be nearly so great as it would otherwise have been, and the grace of Jesus Christ will so sustain him that he will easily repent. When they chanted the response, Benedicens, she stood demanding the benediction in the person of Noah. On receiving it, the Lord in his turn seemed to ask hers. By this, she understood that man blesses God when he repents for having offended his Creator, and when he asks his help to avoid sin for the future. By the words, Ubi est, she knew that the Lord would demand an account from every religious of the sins which her neighbor had committed and which she might have prevented, either by warning the person herself or by informing her superior, and that the excuse of those who say, It is not my place to correct others, or I am as bad as they are, will be no more accepted by God than the words of Cain, Am I my brother's keeper? For each is obliged before God to turn his brother from sin and to assist him in advance in virtue and he who neglects his duty against his conscience offends God. It is useless for him to pretend that he has received no commission, for his own conscience will teach him that God requires it from him, and if he neglects it, God will demand an account of him even more strictly than from a superior who was absent when the evil was committed, or who did not notice it when present. Thus we find these words in Scripture, Woe to him who sins! but a double woe to him who assists in sin. We make ourselves guilty of the sins of others if we consent to it by concealing it when we might procure glory to God by discovering it. They who labor for the advancement of religion are rewarded as if they had clothed the Savior. Angels encompass the blessed. By the response which commences, In do it may, Gertrude learned that he who labors by his works and by his word for the advancement of religion and the defense of justice 
acts as if he clothed God himself with a magnificent and sumptuous garment. And the Lord will recompense him in the life eternal, according to the riches of his royal liberality, by clothing him with a robe of gladness, and crowning him with a diadem of glory. But above all, that he who suffers for the promotion of good, or for religion, is as agreeable to God as a garment which warmed and covered him would be to a poor man. And that if he who labors for the good of religion makes no progress, on account of the obstacles he meets with, his reward will not be for the less for this before God. While they chanted the response, Vocavit Angelus, she knew that the choirs of angels, whose assistance is so powerful, surround the elect to defend them. But God, by his paternal providence, sometimes suspends the effect of this protection and permits the just to be tempted, that he may recompense them gloriously when they have gained a victory with less help from on high and from their angels. At the response, Vocavit Angelus Domini Abraham, she learned that as Abraham justified the claims of obedience by raising his arm and merited to be called by an angel, so when the elect bend their minds and their wills to perform any painful work for the love of God, they merit to taste at that moment the sweetness of grace and to be consoled by the testimony of their own conscience. And this is a favor which the infinite liberality of God bestows even before those eternal recompenses which shall be given to each according to the measure of his works. As the saint reflected on some trials which she had formerly suffered, she inquired of God why she had been thus tried by these persons. When the hand of a father wills to chastise his child, replied our Lord, the rod cannot oppose itself. Therefore I desire that my elect should never attribute their sufferings to those whom I make use of to purify them, but rather let them cast their eyes on my paternal love which would not allow even a breath of wind to approach them unless it furthered their eternal salvation, and therefore they should have compassion on those who stain themselves to purify them. Of Offering Our Actions Through the Son to the Eternal Father One day the saint offered a painful duty to the Eternal Father, saying, Lord, I offer thee this action through thy only Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, for thy eternal glory. And it was made known to her that this intention gave an extraordinary value and price to her work, and elevated it above mere human action, and that this offering was very agreeable to God the Father. And even as objects appear green when seen through a green glass, or red when seen through red glass, so all that is offered to the Eternal Father through His only Son becomes most pleasing and acceptable to Him. Of the utility of prayer when it does not produce sensible fruit. Gertrude inquired of God what advantage some of her friends had gained by her prayers, since they did not seem better for them. The Lord instructed her by this comparison, when a child returns from visiting an emperor, who has enriched him with vast possessions and an immense revenue, those who behold him in the weakness of childhood little imagine the treasures of which he is in possession, although those who have been present are well aware how powerful and important his wealth will render him hereafter. Do not therefore be surprised if you do not see the fruits of your prayers with your bodily eyes since I dispose of them according to my eternal wisdom, a greater advantage. And know that the more you pray for anyone, the happier they will become, because no prayer of faith can remain unfruitful, although we do not know in what manner it will fructify. Of the eternal recompense of directing our thoughts to God. Gertrude desired to know what advantage there was in referring our thoughts to God, and she received this instruction, that when man raises his mind to heaven by meditation or reflection, he presents, as it were, before the throne of God's glory, a bright and shining mirror, 
in which the Lord beholds his own image with pleasure, because he is the author and dispenser of all good. And the more difficulty any one finds in this elevation of soul, the more perfect and agreeable this mere appears before the Most Holy Trinity and the saints, and it will remain for the eternal glory of God and the good of this soul. That adversity prevents occasion of sin and of the good effects of a good will. On a fast day, when the saint was unable to chant from severe indisposition and headache, she inquired of God why he so often permitted these infirmities to visit her on festivals. Our Lord replied, It is to prevent you from dissipating yourself by the pleasures of the harmony of the chant, and so being less disposed to receive grace. But, she inquired, could not thy grace prevent this misfortune? To this our Lord answered, It is a greater advantage to men to turn away occasions of falls by trials, because then they have a double merit, that of patience and that of humility. Once also the saint exclaimed with ardor, O my Savior, why have I not a fire sufficiently strong to melt my heart, so that it might pour forth entirely into thee? Your will, replied the Lord, will be to you the fire which you desire. And from this she knew that by the effort of his will man may fully accomplish all that he desires to do for the glory of God. As the saint often sought by her prayers to obtain the extinction of all vices, both in herself and in others, it appeared to her that this favor could only be obtained by the removal of inclination to evil so that the soul should be enabled to resist evil as easily as she is inclined to it. But she perceived the admirable wisdom of divine providence for the salvation of mankind, which, for the increase of our eternal glory, permits us to combat with our vices that we may be crowned more gloriously in heaven. Of the Effects of Divine Love Having heard a preacher declare that no person could be saved without the love of God, and that all must at least have so much of it as would lead them to repent and to abstain from sin, the saint began to think that many, when dying, seemed to repent more from the fear of hell than from the love of God. Our Lord replied, When I behold anyone in his agony who has thought of me with pleasure, or who has performed any works deserving of reward, I appear to him at the moment of death with a countenance so full of love and mercy that he repents from his inmost heart for having ever offended me, and he is saved by this repentance. I desire, therefore, that my elect should acknowledge this mercy by thanksgivings, and that they should praise me for this amongst the great number of benefits which they receive from me. Once also, as Gertrude meditated on her own sinfulness and depravity, she began to marvel how she could be agreeable in the sight of God, who must behold a thousand imperfections where she saw only one. But our Lord consoled her by this reply, Love makes all agreeable. And she learned that if on earth love has such power that it makes even deformity pleasing, how much more easily can that God who is love render those pleasing to himself by love whom he loves. The Merit of Conforming One's Will to God for Life or Death As the saint desired, like the apostle, to be dissolved and to be with Christ, and poured forth many sighs to God for this end, she was consoled by this reply. Whenever anyone desires with all their heart to be delivered from the prison of the body, and yet at the same time is perfectly willing to remain therein so long as it shall please God. Jesus Christ unites the merit of his adorable life to theirs, which renders them marvelously perfect in the sight of the Eternal Father. That God does not always expect a full return for the graces he bestows, and of the value of fervent desires. As the saint reflected on the little profit she had gained, either for herself or for others, from the many graces which had been bestowed on her, 
she was consoled by this assurance, that God does not bestow his graces on his elect in such a manner as to expect a perfect return, as human frailty often prevents this. But his excessive liberality cannot contain itself, though he knows that man cannot exercise himself in all. Nevertheless, he continually communicates new graces of supererogation in order to raise him thereby to the highest blessedness in the world to come. And even as wealth is bestowed on a child, so that he may profit by it hereafter, though he knows not as yet the value of it, so the Lord communicates his grace to his elect in this life, that he may amass treasures for them, the enjoyment of which will render them happy in heaven. Our Lord prefers suffering without devotion to devotion without suffering. On another occasion, as the saint grieved in her heart that she could not form as ardent desires for the glory of God as she wished to do, she was taught by God that he is perfectly satisfied with our desires when we are not able to do more, and that they are great in proportion to our desire that they should be great. When therefore the heart forms a desire, or wishes to have a desire, God takes the same pleasure in abiding therein as men do in dwelling where flowers are budding forth in the springtime. Once also, when she found herself negligent and distracted from infirmity, and entering into herself, began to confess her fault to our Lord with humble devotion, though she feared that it would be long before she should recover the sweetness of divine grace of which she had been deprived, the infinite mercy of God was moved towards her. And he said to her, My daughter, thou hast been always with me, and all that I have is thine. Then she knew by these words that when through frailty we fail to refer our intentions to God, his mercy still esteems our will worthy of eternal recompense, provided only that our will has not strayed from him, and that we often make acts of contrition for our sins. As the saint felt an illness coming on her immediately before a festival, she desired that our Lord would preserve her health until it was over, or at least permit her to have sufficient strength to assist at it. Still, she abandoned herself entirely to the will of God. Then she received this reply from the Lord, In asking me these things, and at the same time in submitting entirely to my will, you lead me into a garden of delights, enameled with flowers, which is most agreeable to me. But I know that if I grant what you ask, and allow you to assist at these services, I shall be obliged to follow you into the place which pleases you. Whereas, if I refuse you this, and you still continue patient, you will follow me into the place which I prefer, because I find more pleasure in you if you form good intentions in a state of suffering than if you have devotion accompanied by pleasure. The pleasure of the senses deprives of spiritual pleasures. As the saint one day reflected on the arrangements of providence, by which some are filled with consolation, while others experience only dryness, God made known to her that he had created the human heart to contain pleasure, as a vase contains water. But if this vase lets out the water by little holes, it soon becomes empty, or if any water remains, it will eventually dry up. So if the human heart, when filled with spiritual delights, pours itself out through the bodily senses, by seeing, hearing, etc., it will at last become empty, and incapable of tasting the pleasures which are found in God, as each may know by his own experience. If we give a glance, or say a word without reflection, it passes away like water, emptied from a vessel. But if we do ourselves violence for the love of God, celestial sweetness will so increase in our hearts that they will seem too small to contain it. Thus, when we learn to restrain the pleasure of the senses, we begin to find pleasure in God, and the more this victory costs us, the more joy we find in God. Once, as the saint was exceedingly troubled by a matter of little consequence, 
and offered her trouble to God for his eternal glory at the moment of the elevation, it seemed to her that our Lord drew her soul by the host as if by a ladder, until he made it repose on his bosom, and then he spoke thus lovingly to her. In this sacred couch you shall be exempt from every care, but whenever you leave it your heart will be filled with a bitterness as an antidote against evil. Of the caresses with which God favors a faithful soul, and of the esteem we ought to have for patience. Gertrude, finding herself one day depressed by weakness, said to God, Lord, what will become of me, and what dost thou design to do with me? I will comfort you, he replied, even as a mother comforts her child. He added, Have you never seen a mother caress her child? As she did not reply because she did not remember a circumstance of the kind, our Lord showed her a mother whom she had beheld caressing a little child about six months before, and he made her remark three things which she had not observed. First, that this mother often offered to embrace this child, and that the child rose up to come to her, though still weak and frail. He added that thus she ought to rise up to the love of contemplation, to the enjoyment of the adorable object of her love. Secondly, that the mother often tried her child, asking him, Would he have this or that, and yet not giving him what she offered. Thus God sometimes tempts man by allowing him to fear afflictions which never happen, and yet, if he submits freely, God is satisfied with his resignation, and it obtains an eternal reward for him. Thirdly, that none of those who were present except the mother understood what the child said, because he could not yet speak plainly. Thus God alone knows and understands the intentions of men, and judges them accordingly, in which he acts very differently from their fellow creatures, who only consider the exterior. Gertrude inquired one day of our Lord how he desired her to employ her time at that hour. I will that you should learn patience, he replied, for at the time she was very much disquieted. But she replied, How and by what means can I learn it? Then our Lord, like a charitable master who takes up his little scholars in his arms, began to teach her three different letters by which she might learn patience. Consider, he said, in the first place, how a king honors those who are most like him with his friendship, and learn from this how the love which I bear you is increased, when for love of me you suffer contempts like those which I endure. Secondly, consider how much the court respects him who is most like the king, and is most intimate with him, and judge from this what glory is prepared for you in heaven as the reward of your patience. Thirdly, consider what consolation the tender compassion of a faithful friend gives to his friend, and learn from this what compassion I feel in heaven for even the least thought which afflicts you here. Chapter 27 Why God is Pleased by Images of Jesus Crucified On the return of the community from a procession which had been ordered for fine weather, Gertrude heard the Son of God speak thus to his Father from a crucifix which had been carried before the procession. Eternal Father, I come with my whole army to supplicate you under the same form in which I reconciled you to the human race. And these words were received by the Eternal Father with as much complacence as if a satisfaction had been offered to him which surpassed a thousand times all the sins of men. Then she beheld God the Father taking up the image of the crucifix into the clouds with these words, this is the sign of a covenant which I have made with the earth. On another occasion, when the people were suffering exceedingly from the inclemency of the weather, the saint often implored the mercy of God with others, but without effect. At last she addressed her Lord thus, O charitable Lord, 
How canst thou so long resist the desires of so many persons, since I, who am so unworthy of thy goodness, have often obtained much more considerable favors merely by the confidence I have in thee? Why be surprised, replied our Lord, that a father should allow his son to ask him repeatedly for a crown, if he laid by a hundred marks of gold for him each time the request was made? Neither should you be surprised if I defer answering your petition, because each time that you implore my aid by the least word, or even in thought, I prepare a recompense for you in eternity of infinitely greater value than a hundred marks of gold. Chapter 28 Of Spiritual Thirst for God and of the Utility of Sufferings Whilst the psalm, Secret Servi, was chanted in the office for the dead, Gertrude, hearing these words, My soul thirsteth, endeavored to reanimate her fervor, and said to our Lord, Alas, Lord, how feeble are the desires I have for thee, who art my true and only good, and how seldom I can say to thee, My soul thirsteth for thee. You tell me, replied our Lord, not seldom, but without ceasing, that your soul thirsteth after me. For the exceeding love which makes me seek the salvation of men obliges me also to believe that in all the good which my elect desire, they desire me, because all good proceeds from me. For example, if any one desires health, rest, wisdom, conveniences, or any other advantages, my goodness often makes me believe it is me whom they seek in these things, that I may give them a greater reward, unless they deliberately turn their intention from me, as by desiring wisdom that they may satisfy their pride, or health that they may commit some sin. And it is for this reason that I am accustomed to afflict those who are dearest to me with corporal infirmities, with mental depression, and other trials, so that when they desire the goods which are opposed to these evils, the ardent love of my heart may reward them with greater profusion. Gertrude also learned that he whose delight is to be with the children of men, when he finds nothing in them worthy of his presence, sends them sufferings either of body or mind, that he may be able to abide with them, as Holy Scripture says. The Lord is nigh unto those that are of a contrite heart, and I am with him in tribulation. Let such considerations excite our gratitude, and teach us to exclaim with the Apostle and with the whole affection of our souls, O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God! How incomprehensible are his judgments, and how unsearchable his ways, which he has discovered to save men. One night, while the saint was sleeping, our Lord visited her with so much sweetness, and she felt so consoled with his divine presence, that it seemed to her as if she had been refreshed by some delicious feast. When she awoke, she returned thanks to God, exclaiming, How have I merited this, my Lord and my God, more than others, who are so often tormented by horrible dreams? that their very cries terrify those who hear them. Our Lord replied, When those persons whom I have determined to sanctify by suffering seek bodily comforts while they are awake, and thus deprive themselves of occasions of merit, I, in my love, send them sufferings during their sleep, that they may have an opportunity of acquiring merit. But Lord, replied the saint, how can they merit by this when they suffer without any intention and against their will? It is an effect of my mercy, replied our Lord, for the same thing happens to these persons as to those who adorn themselves with waxen ornaments, and who appear well attired, although those who wear gold and precious stones are esteemed more wealthy. Chapter 29 how insidious are the snares of the demon, and especially when we chant. As Gertrude recited her hours without much attention, 
she perceived our ancient enemy mocking her at the psalm Mirabilia, cutting each word short and then exclaiming, Your Creator, your Savior, and your Redeemer has well bestowed on you the gifts of speech, since you can recite so glibly that even in a single psalm you have omitted so many letters, so many syllables, and so many words. She knew from this that if this treacherous enemy had counted so exactly even the least letter or syllable of the psalm which she had omitted or uttered carelessly, what terrible accusations he would bring after death against those who were in the habit of reciting their office hurriedly without any intention. On another occasion, as the saint was occupied in spinning wool, she allowed some little tufts to fall on the ground, thinking only of recommending her work to God with great fervor. In the meanwhile she perceived the demon busily occupied in gathering up the tufts, as if for a testimony of her fault. But the saint invoked the assistance of the Lord, who chased away the evil spirit with indignation, for daring to interfere in a work which had been recommended to God at its commencement. Chapter 30 That our prayers are certainly heard, even though we do not perceive their effect, and how to supply for our unworthiness in approaching Holy Communion through the merits of Jesus Christ and his saints. One day, as Gertrude felt herself enkindled with extraordinary desires, she said, Lord, may I pray to thee now? You may, my beloved one he replied tenderly, because I will comply with your will in all things as a servant would obey the commands of his master. I am well assured, replied the saint, O God, full of charity, that thy words are always true, but since thou dost manifest such condescension towards me, although I am so unworthy of it, whence comes it that my prayers so often remain without effect? Our Lord replied, if a queen desires her servant to give her some thread, which she supposes because she is unable to see behind is hanging from her left shoulder, and he finds it at her right, does he not equally fulfill her intention if he hands it to her from the place he finds it in, as if it were from the place she supposed it to be? So also, if in my inscrutable wisdom I do not hear your prayers exactly as you desire, I do so in a manner more useful for you, though human frailty prevents you from seeing this. As the saint was about to communicate on one occasion, she felt grieved that she had not made sufficient preparation, and she besought the Blessed Virgin and all the saints to offer to God for her all the dispositions which with each had entertained in receiving the various graces which had been granted to them. She then besought our Lord Jesus Christ that he would be pleased also to offer for her the perfection with which he appeared on the day of his ascension, when he presented himself to God the Father and entered into eternal glory. Afterwards she desired to know of what avail this prayer had been to her, and our Lord replied, It has enabled you to appear before the whole court of heaven with all the ornaments you have desired. He added, Why should you distrust me, who am all-powerful and all-merciful, since there is not one upon earth who could not clothe his friend in his own ornaments and garments, and thereby make him appear as gloriously attired as himself? As she remembered afterwards that she had promised to communicate that day for some persons who had recommended themselves to her prayers, she besought God with great fervor to grant them the fruit of this sacrament, and received this reply, I will grant them this favor, but I leave it to their free will to avail themselves of it as they wish. She then inquired how these souls should be prepared to receive this grace, and our Lord answered, Whenever from this time they turn to me with a pure heart and a perfect will, invoking the assistance of my grace, if only by a single word or the least sigh, they will immediately appear clothed with the ornaments that you have obtained for them by your prayers.
Chapter 31 Of the Advantages of Frequent Communion and of Receiving the Holy Viaticum Once also, as the saint was about to communicate, she said, O Lord, what wilt thou give me? I will give myself to thee entirely, he replied, with all the virtue of my divinity, even as my virgin mother received me. But what shall I gain by this, inquired Gertrude, more than those persons who received thee yesterday with me, and who will not receive thee today, since thou dost always give thyself entirely and without reserve? Our Lord replied, If people in the world honor one who has been a consul twice more than a person who has only once filled that office, how shall he fail of greater glory in eternity, who has received me more frequently on earth? Then she exclaimed, sighing, How far above me in beatitude will those priests be who communicate every day to fulfill the duties of their ministry? It is true, replied our Lord, that those who celebrate worthily shall shine in great glory. But the love of him who communicates with pleasure should be judged of very differently from the exterior magnificence which appears in this mystery. There will be one reward for him who has approached with desire and love. There will be another for him who approaches with fear and reverence, and another for him who is very diligent in his preparation. But those who habitually celebrate through custom only shall have no share in my gifts. As the saint prayed that God would permit her to receive the holy viaticum as her last nourishment immediately before her death, she was informed interiorly that her desire was not a good one, for the effect of the sacrament could not be lessened by the trifling refreshment taken in sickness, merely to preserve life for the glory of God. Everything good in man is ennobled by participation in the sacrament which unites him to God, but particularly at the moment of death, after he has received the bread of life, he may merit by all that he does with a pure intention, such as performing acts of patience, eating, drinking, and so forth, by which he accumulates eternal beatitude from this union with the body of Christ. Chapter 32 How God Corrects the Past Negligences of a Soul Who Loves Him and Remedies Those Which May Occur in the Future On the Feast of the Blessed Virgin, on which Gertrude had received some special and admirable gifts, she began to enter into herself, and considering her ingratitude and negligence, she became dejected, because she had shown so little devotion towards the Mother of God and the saints who were honored on that day, on account of the singular favors which they had received. But our Lord, desiring to console her with his ordinary goodness, said to his blessed mother and the saints, Have I not satisfied for her by communicating myself to her with all the sweetness of my divinity in your presence? And they replied, the goodness with which thou hast supplied what she owed to us truly surpasses all our merits. Then our Lord conversed sweetly with his soul and said, Are you satisfied with this reparation? I should be so indeed, my God, she answered, but one thing is wanting to me. I fear, now my past negligences are effaced, that I shall begin to commit new ones. I am so inclined to evil. He replied, I will give myself to you in so efficacious a manner that I will efface entire not only the faults which you have committed, but even those which you may commit. Only be careful to preserve yourself from any stain of sin after you have received the most holy sacrament. As he said these things, she replied, Alas, Lord, I fear that I shall not even fulfill this duty as I ought. Therefore, O most charitable of all masters, teach me, I beseech thee, how I may purify myself from the stains which I may contract. He replied, Do not allow them to remain long in you, but as soon as you perceive them, say with all the fervor of your heart, Lord, have mercy on me, 
or Jesus Christ, who art my only hope, grant that all my sins may be effaced by the merit of thy saving death. The saint then approached to receive the body of Christ, and she perceived that her soul had become as clear as transparent crystal, and that the divinity of Jesus Christ whom she had just received was miraculously encased therein like gold shining through the crystal, and producing such sweet, amazing, and inconceivable effects that the adorable Trinity and all the saints were thereby filled with joy. From this we may know that every spiritual loss can be repaired by worthily receiving the body of Christ. For in truth, the effects produced in her soul by God were so excellent that it appeared as if the whole celestial court testified that their greatest delight was to behold a soul in whom such marvels were performed. The promise which God made her in regard to her future faults must be understood thus, that as one sees equally well on every side an object which is contained in crystal, so also the divine operations were seen in this soul unless they were obscured by the cloud of sin, for this alone could prevent their being discerned. Chapter 33 Of the Value and Importance of Spiritual Communion This holy spouse of Jesus Christ had usually an extreme and ardent desire to receive the body of Christ, and it happened that once when she prepared for communion with more than ordinary devotion, she found herself so weak on Sunday night that she feared she would not be able to communicate. But according to her usual custom, she consulted her Lord to know what would be most pleasing to him. He replied, Even as a spouse who was already satisfied with a variety of viands would prefer remaining near his bride to sitting at table with her, so would I prefer that you should deprive yourself of communion through holy prudence on this occasion, rather than approach it. And how, my loving Lord, can you say that you are thus satiated? The Lord replied, By your moderation in speech, by your guard over your senses, by all your desires, by all your prayers, by all the good dispositions with which you have prepared to receive my adorable body and blood. These are to me as the most delicious food and refreshment. When she came to Mass, though still in a state of extreme weakness, and had prepared for spiritual communion, she heard the sound of a bell announcing the return of a priest who had gone to a village to give communion to a sick person. O oh, life of my soul, she exclaimed, how gladly would I receive thee spiritually if I had time to prepare myself worthily. The looks of my divine mercy, replied the Lord, will impart to you the necessary preparation and at the same time it seemed to the saint that the Lord cast a look upon her soul like a ray of sunlight, saying, I will fix my eyes upon thee. From these words she understood that the look of God produces three effects in our souls, similar to those that the sun produces in our bodies, and that the soul ought to prepare in three ways to receive it. And the effects produced by the glance of divine mercy First, a glance of divine mercy searches the soul and purifies it from every stain, making it whiter than snow. And we obtain this favor by a humble acknowledgment of our defects. Secondly, this look of mercy softens the soul and prepares it to receive spiritual gifts, even as wax is softened by the heat of the sun and becomes capable of receiving any impression. And the soul acquires this by a pious intention. Thirdly, the glance of divine mercy on the soul makes it fruitful in the different flowers of virtue, even as the sun produces and ripens different sorts of fruit. And the third effect is obtained by a faithful confidence, which causes us to abandon ourselves entirely to God, confiding assuredly in the superabundance of His mercy believing that all things will contribute to our eternal welfare, whether they appear favorable or adverse. Thus, 
as some of the community communicated at Mass, our Divine Lord appeared to give himself to each with his own hand, making the sign of the cross as the priest does. The saint, marveling at this, said to him, Lord, have not those who have received thee in this sacrament obtained greater grace than I, whom thou hast gratuitously favored with so many benefits? Who is esteemed most worthy? replied our Lord. He who is adorned with pearls and precious stones, or he who has an immense treasure of pure gold hidden in his house. Making her understand by these words that while he who communicates sacramentally receives without doubt immense grace, both spiritually and corporally, as the church believes, still he who abstains from receiving the body of Christ through obedience and holy discretion and purely for the glory of God, and who being inflamed with divine love communicates spiritually, merits to receive a benediction like that given to the saint, and obtains from God more abundant fruit, although the order and secret of this conduct is entirely hidden from the eyes of men. Chapter 34 On the Utility of Meditating on the Passion of Our Lord and How He Offers Himself to the Eternal Father in Satisfaction for our sins. On a certain Friday, in the evening, Gertrude cast her eyes on a crucifix, and being penetrated with grief, she exclaimed, Ah, my great Creator and my Beloved, what cruelties hast thou not suffered on this day of my salvation? While I, alas, have been so occupied that I have not devoutly recalled what thou didst suffer for me each hour, when thou who art the life which vivifies all things, didst will to die for love of me. To which our Lord answered from the cross, I have supplied what you neglect, for I have accumulated each hour in my heart what you ought to have accumulated in your heart. In consequence, it is so inflamed with love that I have ardently desired this hour in which you have addressed this prayer to me, in union with which I will offer to God my Father all that I have done for you during this day, and without which even that could not be so advantageous for your salvation. We may learn from this the faithful love of God towards man, since he satisfies his eternal Father by a single intention which he excites in them, and this is so sublime and excellent a manner that it merits the everlasting praises of men. As this saint touched the crucifix devoutly, she learned that if any one only looks on the image of the cross of Jesus Christ with a holy intention, God regards him with such goodness and mercy that he receives in his soul as in a spotless mirror an image which is so agreeable that the whole court of heaven delights therein and this serves to increase his eternal glory in the life to come in proportion as he has practiced this act of devotion in this life. On another occasion, she learned that when anyone turns towards a crucifix, he ought to persuade himself that our Lord speaks thus lovingly to his heart. Behold how for your love I have been fastened to this cross, naked, despised, torn and wounded in my body, and in all my members, and still my heart has such tender charity for you that were it necessary for your salvation, and were there no other means of saving you, I would even at this moment suffer for you alone all that I have suffered for the whole world. By this reflection, man ought to excite himself to gratitude, because it never happens that anyone looks at a crucifix without a particular providence. There is no Christian, therefore, who is not guilty if he is so ungrateful as to neglect the adorable price of this salvation, since we can never look at a crucifix thoughtfully without receiving great benefit thereby. On another occasion, as she was occupied in considering the passion of our Lord, it was made known to her that there is infinitely more merit in meditating attentively on the passion of Jesus than in any other exercise. For as it is impossible to handle flour without attaching it to yourself, 
so also is it impossible to meditate devoutly on the passion of the Lord without deriving great fruit thereby. And when anyone reads anything concerning the passion, they at least dispose their souls to receive the fruit of it, as it is more meritorious to meditate on it than any other subject. Let us then endeavor to reflect constantly on it, that it may be honey to our lips, music to our ears, and joy to our hearts. As the saint endeavored to choose amongst the different favors which our Lord had bestowed on her, the graces which would be most for the benefit of others, if revealed to them, our Lord spoke to thus to her, It is most advantageous to men to make known to them that it would be of extreme utility to remember constantly that I, who am the Son of a Virgin, stand before God the Father for the salvation of the human race, and that whenever they commit any fault in their hearts through human frailty, I offer my spotless heart to the Eternal Father in satisfaction for them. When they sin by their actions, I offer my pierced hands, and so in regard to the other faults that they commit. Thus my innocence appeases him and disposes him to pardon those who do penance for their faults, and therefore it is that I desire my elect should return me thanks whenever they have obtained pardon for their faults, because it is through me that they have obtained it so easily. Chapter 35 Of the Bundle of Myrrh, and how we should practice patience in adversity, according to the example of Christ. One night a crucifix which the saint had near her bed seemed to bow down towards her, and she exclaimed, O oh, my sweet Jesus, why dost thou thus abase thyself? He replied, The love of my divine heart attracts me to you. Then she took the image and placed it on her heart, caressing it tenderly and saying, A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me. To which our Lord replied, interrupting her, I will carry him in my bosom, making her to understand by this that we ought to hide in his adorable passion all the pains we suffer, whether of body or mind, as we would place a prop in a bundle of sticks. Thus those who are tempted to impatience by adversity should recall to mind the adorable patience of the Son of God, who was led like a meek lamb to the slaughter for our salvation, and never opened his mouth to utter the least word of impatience. And when any one is disposed to revenge the ill that has been done to him, either in word or deed, he should endeavor to recall to himself with what peace of heart his beloved Jesus suffered, not rendering evil for evil, nor testifying the least resentment by his words, but on the contrary, rewarding those who made him suffer by redeeming them by his sufferings and his death. And thus let us endeavor, according to the example of our Lord, to do good for evil. So also, if anyone entertains a mortal hatred toward those who have offended him, he ought to remember the exceeding sweetness with which the Son of God prayed for his executioners, even when enduring the very torments of his passion, and in the agony of death, praying for his crucifiers with these words, Father, forgive them. And in union with this love, let us pray for our enemies. Our Lord then said, Whosoever hides his sufferings and adversities in the bouquet of my passion, and joins them on to such of my sufferings as they seem most to resemble. He truly reposes in my bosom, and I will give him, to augment his merits, all that my singular charity has merited by my patience and by my other virtues. The saint inquired, How, O Lord, do you receive the spiritual devotion which some have for the image of your cross? Our Lord replied, It is very acceptable to me. Nevertheless, when those who have a special devotion to these representations of my cross fail to imitate the example of my passion, their conduct is like that of a mother, who to gratify herself and for her own honor 
adores her daughter with different ornaments, but refuses her harshly what she most desires to have. Whilst this mother deprives her child of what she wishes for, the child cares little for all else that is given to her, because she knows it is done through pride and not from affection. So all the testimonies of love, respect, and reverence which are offered to the image of my cross will not be perfectly acceptable to me unless the examples of my passion are also imitated. Chapter 26 That Devotion to the Passion of Our Lord Promotes Union with God as Gertrude once sought, with some anxiety, for an image of the Holy Cross, that she might often honor it for love of her Lord, she began to fear that this exterior exercise might hinder her from enjoying the interior favors of God. But our Lord said to her, Fear not, my beloved, for this cannot hinder your spirituality, since I alone will occupy you. For I am not a little pleased with those who honor the image of my crucifixion very devoutly, and as it often happens that when a king has a spouse with whom he cannot always remain, he leaves one who is most dear to him to take charge of her in his absence, and regards all the duties of friendship and affection which she renders to him as if they had been offered to himself, because he knows that this proceeds from her love for him, so that I take pleasure in the veneration offered to my cross when it is offered purely for my love, when the cross is not desired for itself, but that it may serve to renew the memory of the love and fidelity with which I endured the bitterness of my passion, and when there is an ardent desire to imitate the example of my passion. One night, as the saint was occupied in meditating on the passion, she found that the fervor of her zeal had affected her body, and caused an inflammation in the side. When she addressed herself thus to God, My most sweet love, if some persons knew what I now suffer, they would think that I ought to interrupt this exercise in order to recover my bodily health. Although thou knowest, thou who beholdest clearly that which is most hidden within me, that all my strength and my senses could not resist the most passing movement of thy grace. To which our Lord replied, Who could be ignorant of this, without being altogether insensible, that the sweetness of my divinity surpasses incomparably all the pleasures of the flesh and the senses? Since all earthly and corporal pleasure is but as a drop of dew to this great ocean. And yet these sensible pleasures often draw a man away irresistibly, though they know how they endanger not only their bodies, but even their souls. How then should a soul penetrated with the sweetness of my divinity be able to hinder itself from being carried away by the attractions of a love which will constitute its eternal felicity? She replied, But perhaps they would say that as I am professed in a religious order, I ought so to moderate the ardor of my devotion that it may not prove a hindrance to my observance of rule. Then the Lord deigned to instruct her by this comparison. If a chamberlain had been placed at the table of a king in order to serve his majesty with the respect due to him, and if this king from age or infirmity required one who stood by to support him, would it not be an extreme incivility if this chamberlain rose hastily and allowed his master to fall, because he had been also specially chosen to stand and serve at his table? So would it be far more uncourteous if one whom I called in my gratuitous mercy to the enjoyment of my contemplation should withdraw from it to satisfy the requirements of the order in which he was professed, since I, the creator and framer of the universe, take infinitely more pleasure in loving souls than in any labors and corporal exercises performed without love and without a pure intention. But if any person is not really called by my spirit to the repose of contemplation, and yet neglects the observance of his rule to occupy himself therein, 
He is like those who place themselves at the table of the king without being invited, although they were only destined to serve at it. And as a servant who sat at the king's table without being asked would receive contempt instead of honor, so he who neglects his rule and endeavors in his own strength to obtain the gift of contemplation, which none can obtain without a special gift from me, would receive more disadvantage than profit, making no progress in what he had undertaken and becoming tepid in his duty. But as for him who without any necessity and merely for his bodily convenience neglects the exercises of his order and seeks satisfaction in exterior things, he acts as one would do who being destined to serve at the king's table should go out to his stables and defile himself shamefully in cleansing them. Chapter 37 Of the Nails of Sweet-Smelling Cloves, which the saint, moved by love, put into the wounds of the crucifix, instead of the iron nails, and of the gratitude which our Lord testified for this. One Friday, when the saint had spent the whole night in meditation, and had been prevented from sleeping by the ardor of her love, she remembered with what tenderness she had snatched the iron nails from a crucifix, which she always kept near her, and replaced them by nails of sweet-smelling cloves. And she said to God, My beloved, how didst thou accept my drawing the iron nails from the sacred wounds of thy hands and feet, to place these cloves therein, which give an agreeable odor? Our Lord replied, it was so agreeable to me that in return for it I poured forth the noble balsam of my divinity into the wounds of your sins. And for this all the saints will praise me eternally, for your wounds, by the infusion of this liquor, will become agreeable. But, Lord, inquired the saint, wilt thou not grant the same grace to those who perform the same action? Not to all, he replied but those who do it with the same fervor will receive a similar reward, and those who following your example do likewise with all the devotion of which they are capable will receive a lesser recompense. Gertrude then took the crucifix and clasped it to her arms, kissing it tenderly, until she felt herself growing weak from her long vigil, when she laid it aside and taking leave of her spouse, asked his permission to go and rest that she might recover her strength, which was almost exhausted by her long meditation. After she had spoken thus, she turned from the crucifix and composed herself to sleep. But as she reposed, our Lord stretched forth his right hand from the cross to embrace her, and whispered these words to her, Listen to me, my beloved, I will sing you a canticle of love. And then he commenced in a tender and harmonious voice, to sing the following verse to the chant of the hymn Rex Christi Factor Omnium. Amor meus continuus, tibi languor assiduus, amor tuus subissimus, mihi sapor gratissimus. Having finished the verse, he said, Now, my beloved, instead of the Kyrie eleison, which is sung at the end of each verse of the hymn Rex Christi, ask what you will and I will grant it to you. The saint then prayed for some particular intentions, and her prayers were favorably heard. Our Lord again chanted the same verse, and at the end again exhorted Gertrude to pray. This he repeated many times at different intervals, not allowing her a moment's rest until she became completely exhausted. She then slept a little before daybreak, but the Lord Jesus, who was always near those who love him, appeared to her in her sleep. He seemed to prepare a delicious feast for her in the sacred wound of his adorable side, and he himself placed the food in her mouth in order to refresh her, so that when she awoke, she found that she had been marvelously strengthened during her sleep, for which she returned most humble and ardent thanks to God. Chapter 38 How we may remember the Passion of Christ and proclaim the praises of the Virgin Mother of God in reciting the seven 
canonical hours. One night, as Gertrude kept vigil and was occupied with the remembrance of the Lord's passion, as she felt much fatigued, although she had not yet recited matins, she said to God, Ah, my Lord, since thou knowest that my weakness requires rest, Teach me what honor and what service I can render to thy blessed mother, and now that it is not in my power to recite her office. A footnote, not of obligation, but recited by some religious who are not bound to recite the divine office, and also by several of the contemplative orders as a matter of devotion after they have recited their office of obligation. Glorify me, replied our Lord, through my loving heart, for the innocence of that spotless virginity by which she conceived me, being a virgin, brought me forth being a virgin, and still remained a pure and spotless virgin after childbirth. Imitating thus my innocence, when I was taken at the hour of matins for the redemption of the human race, and was bound, struck with rods, buffeted, and overwhelmed piteously, with every kind of misery and opprobrium. While she did this, it appeared to her that the Lord presented his divine heart to the Most Holy Virgin, his mother, under the figure of a golden cup, that she might drink from it, and that being satiated with this sweet beverage, or rather abundantly inebriated thereby, her very soul might be filled with exceeding gladness. Then Gertrude praised the Blessed Virgin, saying to her, I salute thee, most blessed mother, august sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, through the sweetest heart of Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, and the Son of the Eternal Father, beseeching thee to assist us in all our necessities, both now and in the hour of our death. Amen. She knew, when anyone glorified our Lord in these words, and added in praise of the Blessed Virgin, I praise and salute thee, O mother, that each time he presented her his divine heart to satisfy her thirst, in the manner above described, it gave exceeding satisfaction to the Queen of Virgins to be saluted thus, and that she would recompense it according to the extent of her liberality and maternal tenderness. Our Lord then added, At the hour of prime, praise me through my sweetest heart for the most peaceful humility with which the Immaculate Virgin disposed herself more and more to receive me, and imitated the humility with which I, who am the judge of the living and the dead, willed at the same hour to submit myself to a Gentile, to be judged by him for the redemption of mankind. At Thierce, praise me for the fervent desires by which the Blessed Virgin drew me down into her virginal womb from the bosom of my Eternal Father, and imitated me in the ardor and zeal with which I desired the salvation of men. When being torn with whips and crowned with thorns, I bore at the third hour a shameful and infamous cross on my shoulders with extreme meekness and patience. At Sext, praise me for the firm and assured hope with which this celestial virgin thought only of glorifying me by the purity of her intentions, in which she imitated me when I being suspended on the tree of the cross, in all the bitterness and anguish of death, longed with my whole soul for the redemption of the human race, crying out, I thirst, that is, for the salvation of men so that had it been necessary for me to suffer more bitter or cruel torments, I would willingly have borne them for their redemption. At non, praise me for the ardent and mutual love which, which united my divine heart to that of the spotless virgin, and which united and inseparably conjoined my all-glorious divinity with my humanity in her chaste womb imitating me in my mortal life until I expired on the cross at the ninth hour for the salvation of men. At Vespers, praise me for the constant faith of my blessed mother at my death, during the desertion of my apostles and the despair of all, in which she imitated the fidelity with which I descended into limbo after my death, that I might withdraw those souls by my all-powerful hand and mercy, 
and bring them to the joys of paradise. At Compline, praise me for the incomparable perseverance with which my sweetest mother persevered in every virtue even to the end, and imitated me in the work of man's redemption, which I accomplished with so much care, that after I had obtained their perfect redemption by a most cruel death, I nevertheless allowed my incorruptible body to be laid in the tomb to show that there is no degree of contempt or humiliation to which I would not submit for the welfare of man. Chapter 39 That we should give some token of love to God after exterior occupations. It was always a trial to the saint to be obliged, even for a time, to occupy herself with exterior things, and often when this occurred she would rise suddenly in the fervor of her spirit, and hastening to the place where she was accustomed to pray, would exclaim, Behold, Lord, how I am wearied with creatures. I would have no other companionship and no other conversation except thine. I leave them all to seek thee, sole and only good, and delight of my heart and soul. Then, kissing the wounds of Christ five times, she would say each time, Hail, Jesus, my loving spouse, I embrace thee respectfully in the joy of the divinity, with the whole universe, and with all the affection of which I am capable, and I embrace thee in the wounds of thy love. Thus did she pour forth all her griefs into the wounds of her Lord, and find therein all her consolation, and all her joy. As she frequently acted thus, she inquired one day of our Lord if it was agreeable to him, because it only occupied her for a few moments. Our Lord replied, Each time that you turn thus to me, I accept it as a friend would accept the kindness of his friend, who frequently, through the day, endeavored to show him the greatest hospitality by word and act. And even as such a person would consider how he could repay this kindness when his host came to his house, so do I reflect continually, with the greatest pleasure, how I shall repay you and recompense you in glory according to the royal liberality of my omnipotence, of my wisdom, and of my mercy, by testimonies of charity and sweetness multiplied a hundredfold for each offering that you have made me on earth. Chapter 40 Of the Effects of Prayer in Adversity Once, as the community feared an armed attack upon their monastery, they recited the entire Psalter, and at the end of each psalm the verse, O Lux Beatissima, with the antiphon, Veni Sancte Spiritus. Gertrude, who was praying fervently with her sisters, knew interiorly that our Lord, by this prayer, had moved the souls of some of the Holy Spirit to perceive their negligences and to repent. As they felt these movements of compunction, the saints saw a kind of vapor exhaling from the hearts of those who were thus moved, which covered the monastery and the places around it, and drove away every enemy. And in proportion as the heart of each was moved to compunction and inclined to good, the vapor appeared more powerful in expelling evil. Thus she knew that this fear was designed by the Lord to draw to himself the hearts of his elect congregation, that being proved by affliction and purified from their negligences, they might take refuge under his paternal protection and find more abundant succor and consolation. Having perceived this, she said to the Lord, Whence comes it, my loving Lord, that the revelations which thou hast made to me in thy gratuitous mercy are so different from those which thou hast made to others, that persons may often know them, although I so much desire to conceal them. Our Lord replied, If a master, when questioned by persons who speak different languages, answered each in the one tongue, his discourse would only profit those who understood it. But if he speaks to each in his own tongue, in Latin to him who understands Latin, and in Greek to him who understands Greek, then each can comprehend what is said. Thus the greater the diversity with which I communicate my gifts, 
the more my impenetrable wisdom is displayed, which replies to each according to their comprehension and the understanding with which I have gifted them, speaking to the simple by plain and sensible parables, and to the enlightened in a more sublime and hidden manner. Chapter 41 Prayer Composed by Our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, Which He Promised to Hear Favorably On a similar occasion, as the community recited the canticle, Benedicite, adding to each verse prayers proper for the occasion, Gertrude perceived Our Lord standing before her, and at each verse which they recited, prostrate and imploring pardon, he appeared to raise his left arm and offer her the wound of his adorable side to kiss. As the saint embraced it several times, our Lord testified that this mark of her love was extremely agreeable to him. Then she said to him, Since I perceive, my most loving Lord, that thou art pleased with this devotion, do me the favor of teaching me some little prayer which thou wilt receive with a like charity when it shall be addressed to thee devoutly by any one. Then she knew, by inspiration, that if any one shall say these words five times with devotion, Jesus, Savior of the world, have mercy on me, thou to whom nothing is impossible, save to refuse mercy to the wretched, or, O Christ, who by thy cross hast redeemed the world, hear us, or, Hail, Jesus, my loving spouse, I salute thee in the ineffable joys of thy divinity, I embrace thee with the affections of all creatures, and I kiss the sacred wound of thy love. Or, The Lord is my strength and my glory, he is my salvation. If these words are recited in honor of the five wounds of the Lord, kissing them devoutly, adding some prayers or good works, and offering them through the sweetest heart of Jesus Christ, which is the organ of the Most Holy Trinity, they will be as acceptable to God as the most arduous devotion. On another occasion also, when they recited the same canticle, our Lord appeared to her, making burning flames to pour forth from the crucifix, which was usually exposed before the community, and sending them up to God for them, manifesting to her the excessive love and ardent desires of his heart, when he interceded with his father for the welfare of this congregation. Chapter 42 how, how the just delight in God, and how God takes pleasure in them, especially when they commit all their good desires in him. On one occasion, when the saint was prevented by illness from communicating, and she felt her devotion also languishing, she addressed herself thus to God, O oh, sweetness of my soul, knowing, alas, only too well how unworthy I am to approach the sacrament of thy body and blood, I would abstain from communion if I could find consolation in any creature out of thee. But since I can behold nothing from east to west nor from north to south in which I can find any consolation or pleasure either for body or soul except in thee alone, and as I am parched and thirsty, and breathless from desire, I come to thee, the fountain of living water. Our Lord, in his benign love, replied thus, As you assure me that you can find no pleasure apart from me, so I assure you also that I do not wish to find pleasure in any creature apart from you. But as the saint reflected that although the Lord had promised this at that time, still at some future period it might be otherwise. He answered her thoughts thus, My will is the same as my power, and therefore I can do nothing except what I will. But, O most loving Lord, replied the saint, what subject of complacence canst thou find in one who is the repulse and shame of all creatures? The eye of my divinity, he replied, takes extreme pleasure in regarding you on account of the various great gifts which I have bestowed on you. Your words are as a concert of sweet music to my divine ears, whether you utter them to offer me in your love, to pray for sinners, or for the souls in purgatory, to instruct or to correct others, 
or when you speak in any manner for my glory. And though man may obtain no advantage from your words, and they may remain without effect, still the good intention which prompted them, and which has me only for its object, makes them resound sweetly in my ears, and I will cause them to touch even my most inmost heart. The hope with which you sigh after me ascends as a fragrant odor before me. Your prayers and desires are sweeter to me than any perfume, and in your love I find the greatest pleasure. Then the saint began to desire ardently a restoration of her former health, that she might be able to observe the austerities of her order with more exactness. But our Lord replied lovingly, Why does my spouse become importunate to me as if she would oppose my will? What, Lord, she replied, how can a desire which seems to me to be only for thy glory be so opposed to thy will? From the manner in which you ask it, replied our Lord. I consider it only as the desire of a child, but if you should ask it more earnestly, I should not be pleased at your request. From these words the saint knew that the desire of health, from a pure intention of serving God, is indeed good, but that it is far more perfect to abandon oneself entirely to the divine will and to believe that all which God ordains for us, whether of prosperity or adversity, cannot be for our advantage. Chapter 43 Of the Two Pulsations of the Heart of Jesus As Gertrude saw one of her sisters hastening to the sermon, she said to God complainingly, Thou knowest, my beloved, with what pleasure I would now hear this sermon, were I not hindered by sickness? Our Lord replied, Wilt thou, my dear spouse, that I should preach to thee myself? And she answered, Very willingly. Then our Lord made her rest on his heart, so that her soul touched it, and as she remained there some time, she felt two most sweet and admirable movements therein. Then the Lord said to her, Each of these movements operates the salvation of man, in three different manners. The first operates the salvation of sinners, the second that of the just. By the first I converse continually with my eternal Father, I appease his anger against sinners, and I incline him to show them mercy. By the second I speak to my saints, excusing sinners to them, and urging them with the zeal and fidelity of a brother to intercede with God for them. By the third, I speak to sinners themselves, calling them mercifully to penance and awaiting their conversion with ineffable desire. By the second movement of my heart, I invite my Father to rejoice with me for having poured forth my precious blood so efficaciously for the just, in whose merits I find so many delights. Secondly, I invite all the heavenly host to praise my providences, that they may return me thanks for all the benefits which I have granted them, and that I may grant them more for the future. Thirdly, I speak to the just, giving them many salutary caresses, and warning them to profit faithfully by them from day to day and hour to hour. As the pulsations of the human heart are not interrupted by seeing, hearing, or any manual occupation, but always continue without relaxation, so the care of the government of heaven and earth and the whole universe cannot diminish or interrupt for a moment these two movements of my divine heart, which will continue to the end of ages. Chapter 44 Of the manner in which we should ask our Lord for rest or sleep. It happened some time after that Gertrude passed an entire night without sleeping, which so weakened her that her strength entirely failed, and she offered her prostration, as usual, for the glory of God and the salvation of men. Then our Lord, charitably compassionating her weakness, taught her to invoke him by these words, I beseech thee, O most merciful God, by the most tranquil sweetness with which thou hast reposed from all eternity, in the bosom of the Father, 
by thy peaceful abode of nine months in the womb of a virgin, and by all the holy delights which thou hast ever enjoyed in souls filled with thy love, to grant me some rest, not, not for my own satisfaction, but for thy eternal glory, in order that the strength of my wearied body may be restored, and that I may be able to fulfill my duties. And as she said these words, she saw herself coming nearer to God as if she ascended by steps. Then our Lord showed her a place at his right hand and said to her, Come, my beloved, repose on my heart, and see if my anxious love will permit you to rest without anxiety. As she reclined thus on the loving heart of Jesus and felt its sweet pulsations more sensibly, she said to him, O my beloved, what wouldst thou say to me by those pulsations? He replied, I would say that when any one finds herself exhausted and deprived of strength by long wakefulness, and addresses to me the prayer with which I have just inspired you, that I may grant them the strength they need for my service. If I do not hear them, and they bear their weakness with patience and humility, I will console them with the same tenderness and charity as a friend would his friend, who rose up from his bed with alacrity, although overpowered with sleep, merely for the sake of enjoying the pleasure which he found in his conversation. And as this compliance would be even more agreeable to him than if it were offered by a person who usually passed the night without sleeping much, so also is he infinitely more pleasing to me, who, having exhausted all his strength by vigils, offers me his weakness, and bears it with humility and patience, than he who, being more robust, is able to remain entire nights in prayer without suffering much inconvenience. The Reward of Perfect Resignation Chapter 45 Of Perfect Resignation of Ourselves to the Divine Will Gertrude being once ill of fever, which sometimes increased after perspiration and sometimes diminished, finding herself one night bathed in perspiration, began to desire very anxiously to know if she would be better or worse after it. Then our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to her radiant with beauty and bearing health in his right hand and sickness in his left. He presented them to her that she might choose whichever she preferred. But the saint refused both, and casting herself into the arms of her Lord, she approached his loving heart, in which the plenitude of all good abides, that she might learn his adorable will. Our Lord received her with much sweetness and embraced her lovingly, allowing her to rest on his bosom, but she turned her face away from him, and inclining her head backwards exclaimed, I turn my face from thee, and I entreat thee with my whole heart not to consider my inclination in anything, but to accomplish thy adorable will in all that concerns me. From this we may learn that the faithful soul ought to confide all that concerns her to God with perfect confidence, and that she should prefer being ignorant of his designs towards her, so that his will may be more fully accomplished in her. The Lord then poured into the bosom of the saint two streams of living water which came forth from the two sides of his heart, as from a mystic vessel, and said to her, Since you have turned your face from me, and renounced your own will in all things, I will pour forth on you all the sweetness of my divine heart. My sweet Lord, replied Gertrude, since thou hast so often, and in such different ways, bestowed thy deified heart on me, I desire to know what I shall gain from this new gift. He replied, Does not the Catholic faith teach you that I bestow myself with all the riches that are contained in the treasures of my divinity and my humanity for the salvation of those who communicate even once? And that the oftener men communicate, the more their beatitude is increased and perfected. Chapter 46 Of the Sensible Pleasure Which the Soul Finds in God As many persons advise the saint to refrain from meditation until she recovered her health, she complied with their desire, 
being always anxious to do the will of another rather than her own, but on condition that she should be allowed to occupy herself in adorning the crucifixes and other holy images, so that she might at least preserve a perpetual remembrance of Jesus crucified by these exterior representations. One night, as she was occupied in thinking how she could arrange some straw as a sepulcher for the crucifix, on Friday evening, at the commemoration of the Passion after Vespers, the God of love who regards the intention rather than the works of those who love him, insinuated himself into her thoughts thus, Rejoice in God, my beloved, and he will give you all your heart's desires. By these words she understood that when we take pleasure in such things for the love of God, his divine heart is pleased thereby, even as the father of a family engages in excellent concert of music, which entertains those who are seated at table with him, as well as himself. But, my most loving God, inquired the saint, what glory can this exterior satisfaction give thee, which satisfies the senses more than the soul? He replied, even as an avaricious usurer would be sorry to lose the opportunity of gaining a single penny, so I, who find all my joy in you, do not intend to allow even your least thought, nor a single movement of your finger, which you have done for love of me, to pass by without using it for my glory and your eternal welfare. She replied, If thine immense goodness can find pleasure in this, what dost thou say of the verses in which all thy passion is commemorated? I take the same pleasure in them, replied our Lord, as a person would who was conducted by his friend with marks of tenderness and friendship to an agreeable garden, where, while breathing the fresh air and sweet odor of the place, he would also have the pleasure of admiring its beautiful flowers, hearing a concert of exquisite music, and of refreshing himself with the rarest and most exquisite fruits. And I promise you, my beloved, recompense for the satisfaction you have given me by your verses, and also those who read them often with devotion, while they live in this life of sorrow, which leads to the life eternal. Chapter 47 Of the Languor Caused by Divine Love Soon after, during the seventh illness of the saint, as her mind was occupied with God on a certain night, our Lord approached her and said to her with extreme sweetness and charity, Tell me, my beloved, that you languish for love of me. She replied, How can I, a poor sinner, presume to say that I languish for love of thee? Our Lord answered, Whoever offers himself willingly to suffer anything in order to please me, he truly glorifies me, and glorifying me tells me that he languishes for love of me, provided that he continues patient, and that he never turns his eyes away from me. But what advantage canst thou gain from this assurance, my beloved Lord? inquired the saint. The Lord answered, This assurance imparts joy to my divinity, glory to my humanity, pleasure to my eyes, and satisfaction to my ears. Further, the unction of my love is so powerfully moved thereby that I am compelled to heal the contrite heart, that is to say, those who desire this grace, to preach to those who are in captivity, that is, to pardon sinners, to open the door to those who are in prison, that is, to release the souls in purgatory. Gertrude then said to the Lord, Father of mercies, after this sickness, which is the seventh that I have had, wilt thou not restore me to my former health? Our Lord replied, if I had made known to you at the commencement of your first illness that you would have to endure seven, perhaps you would have given way to impatience through human frailty. So also, if I now promised you that this would be the last sickness, the hope with which you would look forward to its termination might lessen your merit. Therefore, the paternal providence of my uncreated wisdom as wisely ordained that you should remain ignorant on both subjects, that you might be obliged to have recourse to me continually with your whole heart, 
and to recommend your troubles, whether exterior or interior, to my fidelity, since I watch over you so faithfully and lovingly that I would not permit you to be tried beyond your strength, knowing how much your patience can bear. This you can easily understand if you remember how much weaker you were after your first sickness than you are now after your seventh. For although human reason might have considered this impossible, yet nothing is impossible to my divine omnipotence. Chapter 48 That the faithful soul ought to abandon herself to the will of God for life and death. As the saint offered various testimonies of her love to God during the night, asking him, amongst other things, how it happened that she had never wished to know whether her sickness would end in life or death, though it had lasted so long, and how it was that she felt equally indifferent to either, our Lord answered to her thus, When a bridegroom conducts his bride into a garden of roses to gather them for a bouquet, she takes so much pleasure in his sweet conversation that she never pauses to inquire which of the roses he would wish her to gather, but she takes whatever flower her bridegroom gives her and places it in her bouquet. So also the faithful soul, whose greatest pleasure is the accomplishment of my will and delights in it as in a garden of roses, is indifferent whether I restore her health or take her out of the present life because, being full of confidence, she abandons herself entirely to my paternal care. One night, also, when the saint was much exhausted by her spiritual exercises and by the interior converse she had had with her Lord, she took a few grapes with the intention of refreshing her spouse and herself. The Lord received them with much gratitude and said to her, I am now compensated for the bitter draught offered me in a sponge as I hung on the cross for your love, because I taste now in your heart an ineffable sweetness, and the more purely you recreate your body for love of me, the sweeter is the refreshment I find in your soul. As she had thrown from her the skins and stones of the grapes which she had in her hands, she saw the devil, the persecutor of all good, trying to gather them up, as if to reproach her for the dispensation which her infirmity had made her take by eating after matins contrary to the rule. But the moment he attempted to touch one of the skins, he was so scorched and burned, as if by devouring flames, that he fled from the house, uttering fearful cries, and taking care for the future, how he touched anything that could cause him such frightful torments. Chapter 49 Of the Benefit We May Derive From Our Faults One night, as Gertrude was occupied in examining her conscience, she remarked that she had a habit of saying, God knows, without reflection and without necessity. And having blamed herself very severely for this fault, she besought the Divine Majesty never to permit her to use his sweet name lightly again. Our Lord replied lovingly to her, Why would you deprive me of the glory and yourself of the immense reward which you acquire every time you perceive this fault, or a similar one, and seriously endeavor to correct it? For when anyone exerts himself to overcome his faults for love of me, he offers me the same testimony of fidelity and respect as a soldier would do to his captain when he courageously resisted his enemies in battle overcoming them all, and casting them to the ground with his own arm. After this, as the saint rested on the bosom of her Lord, she felt a great weakness of heart, which she offered thus to him. My beloved spouse, I offer thee this debilitated heart with all its affections and desires, that thou mayest take pleasure therein according to thy will. He replied, I accept your offering of this weak heart and prefer it to a strong one, even as the hunter prefers what he has taken in the chase to tame animals. Although the infirmities of the saint prevented her from assisting in choir, still she often went to listen to the office 
in order thus to exercise her body in some manner in the service of God, and reflecting that she was not as attentive or recollected as she desired, she manifested her grief to her divine spouse, saying to him with a dejected heart, What glory canst thou receive, my loving Lord, from my sitting here, in this idle and negligent manner, paying so little attention to what is said or chanted to thy glory? Our Lord replied, And what satisfaction would you not have if your friend presented you with a draught of newly made and delicious mead, which you thought would strengthen you? Be assured, then, that I find infinitely more pleasure in every word, and even every syllable, to which you listen attentively for my glory. At the Mass, which was celebrated after, Gertrude felt unable to rise at the Gospel, and she doubted whether to spare herself or not on such occasions, as she had no hope of her recovery. But she asked God, according to her custom, what would be most for his glory. He replied, When, for love of me, you do anything with difficulty, and which is beyond your strength, I receive it even as if I had an absolute need of it. But when you omit anything to take due care of your body, referring all to my glory, I consider it in the same manner as an infirm person would consider some relief that it was possible for him to do without. Thus, I will recompense you for both according to the greatness of my divine munificence. Chapter 50 Of the Renewal of the Seven Sacraments in Her Soul and of Fraternal Charity as Gertrude examined her conscience one day, she discovered some faults which she was extremely anxious to confess. But as she could not have recourse to her confessor at the time, she began as usual to discover her grief to our Lord, who consoled her thus. Why, he inquired, are you troubled, my beloved, since I am the sovereign priest and true pontiff, to whom you can have recourse? and I can renew in your soul with great efficacy the grace of the seven sacraments by a single operation than either priest or bishop could by conferring each separately. For I will baptize you in my precious blood, I will confirm you in my victorious strength, I will espouse you in my faithful love, I will consecrate you in the perfection of my holy life, I will absolve you from all your sins, by the charity of my heart. I will feed you myself by my overflowing tenderness, and I will feed myself also on you. I will purify you inwardly by so powerful an anointing of the sweetness of my spirit that all your senses and your actions will breathe the most fervent piety, which pouring down on you like holy oil will sanctify you more and more unto life eternal. Once when the saint had risen to say matins, although in a state of extreme weakness, and had already finished the first nocturne, another religious, who was also ill, came to her, and she immediately recommenced the matins with her with great charity and devotion. Afterwards, being occupied with God during Holy Mass, she perceived that her soul was magnificently adorned with precious stones, which emitted a most admirable brightness. Our Lord then made known to her that she had received those gifts in recompense for her humble charity in having recommenced her matins for the convenience of a younger sister, and that she had received as many different ornaments as she had repeated words. The saint then remembered some negligence of which she had not been able to accuse herself in confession on account of the absence of her confessor, and as she mourned over this to our Lord, he said to her, Why do you complain of your negligences, you who are so richly clothed with the robe of charity, which covers a multitude of sins? How can I console myself, she replied, when I still perceive that I am stained by them? But our Lord answered, Charity not only covers sins, but like a burning sun consumes and annihilates the slightest imperfections and overwhelms the soul with merit. Gertrude once perceived that a person neglected some observances of the rule, 
and feared that she would be guilty in the sight of God if she did not correct it, as she knew of it. But she also apprehended that some who were less strict might think she interfered more than was necessary in trifling matters. This trouble, however, she offered according to her custom to our Lord, who, in order to show how agreeable her devotion was to him, said to her, Each time that for love of me you suffer this reproach, or any similar to it, I will strengthen you mightily, and will encompass you as a city is encompassed with trenches and walls, so that no occupation will be able to distract you or to separate you from me. And further, I will add to your merit that which any one might have acquired if they had submitted themselves with humility to your admonitions. Chapter 51 of the fidelity which we must only expect to find in God, and of the grace of patience. As it usually happens that the injuries which we receive from a friend are more difficult to bear than those which we receive from an enemy, according to the words of Scripture, If my enemy had reviled me, I would verily have borne with it. Gertrude, knowing that a certain person for whose welfare she had labored with extreme solicitude, did not respond with the same fidelity to her care, and even through a kind of contempt acted contrary to what she advised, had recourse to our Lord in her affliction, who consoled her thus, Do not be grieved, my daughter, for I have permitted this to happen for your eternal welfare, that I may the oftener enjoy your company and conversation in which I take so much pleasure. And even as a mother who has a little child whom she loves specially, and therefore desires to have always with her, places something that will alarm her, and oblige her to come back into her arms, when she has strayed from her, so also, desiring to have you always near me, I permit your friends to contradict you in some things, that you may find no true fidelity in any creature, and therefore have recourse to me with all the more eagerness, because you know that I possess the plentitude and stability of all contentment. After this, it seemed to her as if our Lord placed her in his bosom like a little child, and there caressed her in many ways, and approaching his adorable lips to her ears, he whispered to her, as a tender mother soothes the troubles of her little one, by her kisses and embraces, so do I desire to soothe all your pain and grief by the sweet murmur of my loving words. After the saint had enjoyed these and many other consolations for some time, our Lord offered her his heart and said to her, Contemplate now, my beloved, the hidden secrets of my heart, and consider attentively with what fidelity I have ordered all that you have desired of me for your benefit and the salvation of your soul. And see if you can accuse me of unfaithfulness to you even by a single word. When she had done this, she beheld our Lord crowning her with a wreath of flowers, more radiant than gold, as a reward for the trial of which we have just spoken. Then the saint, remembering some persons who she knew were tried in other ways, said to God, Surely these persons merit to receive from thy liberality, Father of mercies, a richer recompense, and to be adorned with more splendid ornaments than I, since they are not assisted by the consolations which I receive, though so, so unworthy, and since I do not bear what happens to me with the patience I ought. Our Lord replied, In these things, as in all others, I manifest the special charity and tenderness which I have for you. Even as a mother who loves her only child wishes to adorn her with ornaments of gold and silver, but knowing that she could not bear their weight, decks her with different flowers, which without incommoding her do not fail to add to her attractions. So also I moderate the rigor of your sufferings, lest you should fall under the burden and thereby be deprived of the merit of patience. Then, as the saint reflected on the great care of the divine mercy for her salvation, she began to praise him with great gratitude, 
and she perceived that those flowers with which her sufferings had been mystically rewarded expanded more and more as she returned thanks. She understood also that the grace that God had given her of praising him in adversity was as much more excellent as an ornament of solid gold is to one which has merely been gilt. Chapter 52 The Value of a Good Will A certain nobleman, having sent to the monastery to ask the religious to found a convent, Gertrude, who was always anxious to accomplish the will of God, though she was unable to comply with this request, cast herself before a crucifix, and offered herself to God with her whole heart, praying that his holy will might be accomplished. It seemed to her that our Lord was so deeply touched by this offering that he descended from the cross to embrace her with extreme affection and gladness, and received her with marks of ineffable joy, even as a sick person, who had been given over by the physician, would receive a remedy which he had long desired, and which he hoped might restore his health. And having then gently approached her to the adorable wound of his side, he said to her, You are welcome, my beloved. You are the balm of my wounds, and the sweetener of all my griefs. Gertrude knew by these words that when any one abandons his will without reserve to the good pleasure of God, whatever adversity may be impending, our Lord receives it as if he had anointed his wounds, even at the very hour of his passion, with the most precious and healing ointments. After this, as Gertrude prayed, she began to think of many things, by which she hoped to procure the glory of God and the advancement of religion. But after a time she reproached herself for these reflections, which perhaps could never bear any fruit, because she was so weak that she seemed more likely to die than to be able to undertake any laborious work. Then the Lord Jesus appeared to her in the midst of her soul, radiant with glory, and adorned with roses and fair lilies, and he said to her, Behold, how I am adorned by your good will, even as I was by the stars and the golden candlesticks, in the midst of which St. John, in the Apocalypse, declares that he saw the Son of Man standing and having seven stars in his right hand. And know that I have received as much pleasure from the other thoughts of your heart as from this sweet and agreeable garland of lilies and roses. O God of my heart, exclaimed the saint, why dost thou embarrass my soul with so many different desires, which are all without effect, since it is so short a time since thou didst give me the thought and desire of receiving extreme unction, and dispose my soul to receive it by filling me with such joy and consolation. And now, on the contrary, thou dost make me desire the establishment of a new monastery, although I am still so weak that I am scarcely able to walk. I do this, replied our Lord, to accomplish what I have said at the commencement of this book that I have given you to be the light of the Gentiles, that is, to enlighten many people. Therefore it is necessary that your book should contain information on many subjects for the consolation and instruction of others. And as two persons who love each other often find pleasure in conversing on subjects which do not specially concern them, as a friend often proposes to his friend the most difficult and intricate questions, so do I take pleasure in proposing many things to my elect which will never happen to them, in order to prove their love and fidelity for me, and to reward them for many purposes which they cannot carry into effect, counting all their good intentions as if they had been carried into action. So I inclined your will to desire death, and consequently made you feel this wish to receive extreme unction and I have preserved in the depth of my heart for your eternal salvation all that you have done in thought or act to prepare yourself for this sacrament. Thus you may understand these words, The just man, if he be prevented with death, shall be in rest. For if you were deprived of this sacrament by sudden death, or if you receive it after you had lost consciousness, which often happens to my elect, you would not suffer any loss thereby, 
because all the preparation for death which you had made for so many years is preserved in the unfading springtime of my divinity, where, by my cooperation, it always remains green and flourishing and fructifying for your eternal salvation. Chapter 53 How We May Profit by the Merit of Others Gertrude was requested by a person, when she offered to God all the gratuitous gifts with which he had favored her, to ask that she might have a share in their merit. As she prayed thus, she perceived this person standing before the Lord, who was seated on his throne of glory, and held in his hand a robe magnificently adorned, which he presented to her, but still without clothing her in it. The saint, being surprised at this, said to him, when I made a similar offering to thee a few days since, thou didst at once take the soul of the poor woman for whom I prayed to the joys of paradise. And why, most loving Lord, dost thou not now clothe this person with the robe which thou hast shown her, and which she so ardently desires, through the merits of the graces thou hast bestowed on me, though so unworthy of them? Our Lord answered, when anything is offered to me for the faithful departed, I immediately use it for them according to my natural inclination to show mercy and pardon, either for the remission of their sins, for their consolation, or for the increase of their eternal felicity, according to the condition of those for whom the offering is made. But when a similar offering is made for the living, I keep it for their benefit because they can still increase their merits by their good works, by their good desires, and by their good will. And it is only reasonable that they should endeavor to acquire by their labor what they desire to obtain through the intercession of others. Therefore, if she for whom you pray desires to be clothed with your merits, she must study these three things. First, she must receive this robe with humility and gratitude. That is to say, she must acknowledge humbly that she has need of the merits of others, and she must render me fervent thanksgivings for having deigned to supply her poverty out of their abundance. Secondly, she must take this robe with faith and hope, that is, hoping in my goodness, she must believe that she will receive thereby a great assistance to her eternal salvation. Thirdly, let her clothe herself in charity, exercising herself in this and in other virtues. Let all those who desire a share in the merits and virtues of others act in like manner, if they would profit thereby. Chapter 54 Prayer Composed by the Saint Gertrude, having been bled some time after the fast, probably after Lent, she was frequently heard uttering these words, O King of all kings, the most excellent, O illustrious prince, with others of a similar import. And as she recollected herself one morning in the place where she usually prayed, she said to God, O most loving Lord, what wilt thou that I should do with these words, which so often present themselves to my mind and my lips? Then our Lord showed her a golden collar, composed of four parts, which he held in his hands. But as the saint did not know what these four parts signified, he made known to her in spirit that the first part represented the divinity of Christ, the second, the soul of Christ, the third, every faithful soul whom he had espoused in his own blood, and the fourth, the pure and immaculate body of Christ. She knew also that the reason why the faithful soul was placed in this collar, between the soul and the body of Jesus Christ, was to show with what indissoluble love the Savior had united the faithful soul to his own body and soul. And suddenly she was inspired with these words, in a rapture, at the sight of this collar. Thou art the life of my soul. May all the desires of my heart be united to thee by thy burning love. May they languish and die whenever they turn to any object apart from thee. For thou art the beauty of all colors, the sweetness of all taste, the fragrance of all odors, the harmony of all sounds, 
the charm of all embraces. In thee is the voluptuousness of delight. From thee flows forth a torrent of love. To thee are all drawn by thy powerful attractions, and by thee all receive the sweet influences of love. Thou art the overflowing abyss of the divinity. O King, greater than all kings, supreme emperor, sovereign prince, peaceful ruler, faithful protector. Thou art the vivifying gem of human nobility with the noblest sentiments. Thou art a worker full of skill, a master full of clemency, a counselor full of wisdom, a defender full of kindness, a friend most faithful. Thou art the sweet savor of all delights. O gentle caresser, whose touch imparts healing, O ardent lover, sweet and chaste spouse, thou art the spring flower of unchanging beauty. O loving brother, beautiful youth, joyful companion, liberal host, careful administrator, I prefer thee to every creature. For thee I renounce all pleasures. For thee I seek all adversity. And in all this I desire only thy glory. My heart and lips testify that thou art the quickener of all good. I unite by the merit of thy love the fervor of my devotions to the virtue of thy prayers, so that by the power of this divine union I may be raised to the highest perfection, and all rebellious movements may be calmed within me. All these sentences seemed like so many brilliant stones separately encased in the gold of this collar. On the following Sunday, as Gertrude assisted at the Mass at which she was to communicate, and recited this prayer with much devotion, she perceived that our Lord was pleased with it, and she said to him, O most loving Lord, since I perceive that these words are so agreeable to thee, I will advise as many persons as I can to offer it to thee devoutly as a precious collar of pearls. Our Lord replied, No one can give me what is mine, but whoever recites it devoutly shall feel his knowledge of me increase, and shall receive light from my divinity, which shall be showered down on him by the efficacy of these words, even as they who hold a plate of polished metal to the sun behold therein the reflection of its light. The saint immediately felt the effect of these words, for as soon as she had recited this prayer, she perceived that the surface of her soul became radiant with divine light, and she found an increase of sweetness and pleasure in divine things. Chapter 55 Our Lord Shows Her His Heart Jesus Christ once appeared to the saint, and showing her his heart said to her, my beloved, give me your heart. And as she presented it to him with profound respect, it seemed to her that he united it to his by a canal which reached to the ground, through which he poured forth abundantly the effusions of his infinite grace, saying to her, Henceforth I shall use your heart as a canal through which I will pour forth the impetuous torrents of mercy and consolation which flow from my loving heart on all those who shall dispose themselves to receive it by having recourse to you with humility and confidence. Chapter 56 Of Charity Towards an Erring Brother As the saint prayed one day for some persons who had formerly injured the convent seriously by their thefts, and were again committing depredations, our Lord appeared to her as if suffering much pain in one of his arms, which was so drawn back that the nerves were seriously injured. And he said to her, Consider what torment he would cause me, who should strike me with his closed hand on this suffering arm, and reflect that I am outraged in like manner by all those who, without compassionating the danger, to which the souls who persecute, persecute you are exposed, do nothing else but talk maliciously of their sins and what they have suffered in consequence, without reflecting that these unhappy people are members of my body, while all those who touch by compassion implore my mercy for them 
that I may convert them. Act towards me as if they soothe the pain of my arm with healing ointments. And I consider those who by their counsels and charitable warnings try to induce them to amend their lives as wise physicians who endeavor to restore my arm to its proper position. Then Gertrude, admiring the ineffable goodness of God, said to him, But how, Lord, can these unworthy persons be compared to your arm? He replied, Because they are members of the body of the church, of which I glory in being the head. But, my God, exclaimed Gertrude, they are cut off from the church by excommunication, since they have been publicly anathematized for the violence they've done to this monastery. Nevertheless, replied the Lord, as they can be restored to the bosom of the church by absolution, my natural goodness obliges me to care for them, and I desire with incredible ardor that they should be converted and do penance. The saint then prayed that the monastery might be defended from their snares by his paternal protection, and she received this reply, If you humble yourselves under my mighty hand, and acknowledge before me in the secret of your hearts that your sins have merited this chastisement, my paternal mercy will protect you from all the efforts of your enemies. But if you rise up proudly against those who persecute you, wishing them evil for evil, then, by my just judgment, I will permit them to become stronger than you and to afflict you still more. Chapter 57 that the care of temporal affairs and exterior duties may be acceptable to God. One year, when the convent was much burdened by a heavy debt, the saint prayed to God with more devotion than usual that the convent procurators might be able to pay their debts. He replied tenderly, What advantage shall I gain if I assist them in this? The saint replied, They will then be able to occupy themselves with more fervor and recollection in their spiritual duties. And what will this advantage me, continued our Lord, since I have no need of your goods, and it is equally the same to me whether you employ yourselves in bodily or mental exercises, provided you refer your intention to me. For if I only took pleasure in spiritual exercises, I should have so reformed human nature after the fall that it would no longer have needed food or clothing or any of the other necessaries of life, which are now obtained with so much labor. And as a powerful emperor is pleased, not merely with bringing up noble ladies in the court of his empress, but also brings up in his own court nobles, captains, and soldiers, who are employed in different ways, that they may serve him when any occasion presents itself, so also I take pleasure not only in the interior delights of contemplation, but also in the different exterior affairs and preoccupations of the children of men with whom I love to dwell when they labor in them for my love and for my glory, because in these occupations they are so much exercised in charity, patience, humility, and other virtues. After this the saint beheld the person who had the principal charge of the temporal affairs of the monastery as if he were resting on the left hand of the Lord, and it appeared to her that he often rose with great pain, and offered him a piece of gold enriched with a precious stone. Our Lord then said to her, Know that if I lessen the troubles of him for whom you pray, I should be also deprived of these precious stones which are so acceptable to me, and he would lessen the recompense which he will receive. For then, he would only be able to offer me with his right hand this piece of gold without any ornament. He presents me with a piece of gold who, without suffering any adversity, refers all his actions to God according to his adorable will. But he who is constantly suffering and still conforms himself to the decrees of providence offers me gold enriched with very rare and precious stones.